So, um, so you want to solve the topological string on the compact Calabi-Yau, and uh, so I will address a couple of uh, questions which um, are different and um, to the local case and so on. So we want to solve the topological uh, string on compact uh, Calabi-Yau threefold, and I will call this M. <coughs> And um, and what I mean by that, so is now maybe more specific, is the um, is the um, <coughs> a string partition function. So it's the closed string partition function. So <coughs> so this will depend on certain uh, Keller parameters, and it will depend on the string coupling. And we all know it's a sort of perturbative expansion. And then uh, <coughs> there will be a class uh, kappa, let's say in H2MZ. And there will be a sum over the genus uh, G equals zero to infinity. And then <coughs> there are, uh, so this is a generating function like uh, 2G, uh, so this is GS, 2G minus two. And then <coughs> uh, there are uh, numbers that we want to know. So, um, so let's say uh, R. So they are labeled by this club kappa. Let's put it up, and then G. And then there is a parameter which counts. Let's call this Q kappa. So this counts the class kappa. So it's a generating function basically for all these numbers. And these numbers are Gromov-Witten invariants, and we would like to know them. And uh, <coughs> the, the t, this t parameter is hidden here. So t is something like uh, the volume of a curve. So you have, um, you have um, um, B field, and you have, so it's some, somehow the complex volume of the, uh, the volume of the curve complexified with the B field. And you write it in this combination, and then the uh, Q kappa is something like E to the T kappa. And uh, <coughs> so in this way, you get, um, you get the scalar volumes in. So these are the scalar parameters. Now, um, <coughs> now, in some sense, uh, this is a perturbative expansion. You have to uh, think whether it makes sense or whether there are better forms of it and so on. But what I can give you today is basically is an attempt to give you this function for elliptically fibered Calabi-Yau in a, a more or less closed form, uh, uh, in that I expand in the base of the elliptic vibration. So for every fixed class in the base, I give you a closed form. And, and so that's the aim of the talk. <coughs> so of course, there's a certain motivation. So of course, uh, I said already, this solves chrome of Witten theory, uh, <coughs> solves uh, GV theory, or the, at least the counting problem of it. And it would also solve, this was already in Martin's talks, it solves maybe uh, DT on PT theory, uh, because these invariants are related. And then uh, <coughs> what is more, interesting for me and where I get some structure out, it also solves a BPS counting problem in five dimensions, in 5D. And um, <coughs> this BPS counting problem basically is you look at the 5D Poincaré group uh, and then you, um, <coughs> you see that uh, there is the little group of the 5D Lorentz group, so there's the little group, and this is SU2 uh, left times SU2 right. And uh, <coughs> now uh, there is certainly a mass to get this Poincaré representation, there's a mass. And you sort of want to calculate something which, um, which uh, depends here on the right spin and the left spin and the mass. And uh, <coughs> so what you, uh, uh, what you want to do, you want to take a trace of the Hilbert space of these BPS states. And then you uh, <coughs> have various choices. So for instance, uh, first I will sort of uh, don't resolve the right spin. So I write something like just uh, JR like this. And then you write a parameter for the left spin. 
and then you write something which measures the, um, I mean, measures the energy. But since there are BPS states, this energy is uh, fixed by a charge lattice, and this charge lattice turns out to be this cohomology lattice. So then, this this is where the kappa class comes in, and so <coughs> at the end, you get something which um, which you can write, and this was done by Kopa Kuman Waffa. Uh, you can write it, well, also by Nekrasov uh, independently somehow, and so you can write it as. Um, as a sum over, let's say, the genus, which is positive, and then uh, there is an E kappa G, and then this parameter Y appears here, so it's something like something that we also saw in Martin's talk already, and then there's a 2G, and then you have this E to the T kappa that uh, measures is basically this Q. So this, this uh, measures the mass, and then they are fixed by this kappa class, and this kappa lies in the lattice, and this is because they are uh, BPS states. <coughs> but then there is actually a very interesting formula that is implied by that, which I really use uh, in the following. And that formula, I mean, it, uh, again, it goes back to Narain, uh, Taylor, and then was uh, made more general by Gopakuma and Wafa. So this formula looks like this. It basically involves these quantities here. So these are BPS indices, and they are uh, they can be B and Z. So note that if you sort of uh, resolve uh, this uh, this right spin, so maybe uh, resolve um, J right, and then you get this uh, this minus one gets a U, and then you uh, get on the right hand side uh, things which have, uh, depend on J left and J right, and not just on the genus, and on B on kappa. And these are actually in N, and that's sometimes interesting. So this is more, this is more like a real counting problem. This is like an index counting problem. And for you can actually do both in the cases that I will discuss. I only uh, restrict myself to the um, index counting problem because the formulas are simpler. But you can certainly do both with the, uh, very similar formalism that you will see. So uh, <coughs> so then you get here. Uh, well, m from 1 to infinity, and then you get a sum uh, over g from 0 to infinity, and then you get a sum uh, over this uh, kappa that we already had. And, uh, <coughs> and then you get this i g kappa, and then you get um, g s m over 2, and then uh, two, uh, g minus 2, and then you get again this um, e to the m t kappa. Okay, so this formula is sort of uh, slightly bizarre, and it has been used, the fact that it's slightly bizarre, because if it is a, a perturbative expansion, then uh, at all rational po uh, po uh, numbers of gs, it has actually poles. That's, that's pretty bizarre. So, um, so let me say note the poles. So these come from genus zero, because then this is minus one, and so note the poles at, um, so these poles, of course, will play a role. So if they are rational, then you get the poles. And that's, that's already, I mean, this is uh, one of the starting point of this non-perturbative completion that Marcus and his friends are studying. So that is also true for the compact case and for the non-compact case. <coughs> but now, let me um, <coughs> say generally that, so let me not erase this formula for a second. So, uh, <coughs> so I erased already a formula which uh, maybe you would have protested. So why should you have protested? So let me write this formula again. Um, so let's write it like gs2g minus and then write just ft like this. So this is better for this purpose. And you see, these things are a Kähler line bundle. So they, so they live in the Kähler line bundle. I mean, this comes from special geometry, like we heard in the talk of Belavin. So this is like uh, a section of uh, L2g minus 2. So then, if you think this is a good object, you have a problem, because this comes in all powers of the exponential. If you make a Keller transformation, you get, uh, you get a problem. And uh, <coughs> I will come to this point 
uh, later, but you can you can th th you can remedy f uh, fi this. You can say, okay, I take GS, and I take a I take a period of that. Now the period uh, works. The period transforms in the inverse line bundle. So then this formula cer certainly makes sense. But then it's not anymore has any good modular properties because the period is some complicated object that uh, transforms very complicated on the monodromy. And in some sense, the reason that in the local case you have this is one, you have a global section here, makes this formula work. If you apply it, I mean, for instance, this wave function, seeing in the local case, this has beautiful application. But in the global case, this thing is very much spoiled, this property. So, uh, <coughs> so this would be only in the local case. And this is a huge difference. For this, uh, for these things, uh, for the global case. But let me now come uh, to the to the, um, the geometries that I want to consider. And these geometries have very much to do with the talk that you heard by Martin Cole. So, uh, so it, except that I'm not looking at elliptic surfaces, but I'm looking at elliptic uh, threefolds. So, um, <coughs> so let me sort of. Um, make this small remark, so basically local Calabiao, they are always, so to say, of the type, you take a total space, so M, what is my Calabiao, is basically the total space of the anti-canonical line bundle over some base. So what I want to do is, uh, so this is, uh, this, and then, uh, and then this can be solved in many ways. So what I want to do today is basically to change the setting slightly, but not so much. So we, we make a, a, a Calabi-Yau threefold, which is compact. So this is clearly non-compact because you have this non-compact line bundle. But the only thing that I want to do is I want to exchange this compact, uh, this uh, non-compact uh, non line bundle by an elliptic fiber. So then you have this situation and M is compact. And that is not at all very out, outlandish when you look at uh, the history of Calabiao. So, for instance, if you take the uh, degree 18 uh, constraint in, let's say, uh, nine weighted projective space. So, unfortunately, because of that scheme, we cannot do anything which is uh, low. Aha, uh -huh. so maybe we should just uh, put it down. <coughs> okay, so then. Um, you have this Calabiao, so this is one of the early things, it's a degree 18 hypersurface um, in uh, this projective space, uh, weighted projective space, so it's uh, 69611. Uh, uh, and now if you write this down, you can immediately see that uh, you get an equation which has this elliptic structure because you call this coordinate y, you call this coordinate x, and this coordinate you call u. And then, of course, it's already elliptical. So it goes y squared, and then you have, I don't know, I don't care about the coefficient at the moment. You have x to the 3 because it's degree 18. And then you get something like a x y z. And then you have a product of this u's. Let me call them u, u uh, prime for the second. And then uh, you get uh, a z to the 6. So the c to the 6 you don't see there because this has a singularity. You need a blow-up parameter, and this is the c to the 6. And then we have a b uh, phi i from 1 to r u uh, i 6. And then you get a, a polynomial pb u of m. And this I write down because now you can see. So this is the constraint. So this is basically the constraint. Uh, for this particular Calabiao, but you can uh, replace this base. So if this, uh, in this case, the base is actually uh, P2, but you can certainly do this for any base. So that's uh, it's very simple. How many singular fibers does it have? Yeah, so this, ca this guy has exactly the same situation in Martin Cole's talk. It has, um, it has at co-dimension one, has only Kodaira fibers E1, and then at higher co-dimension, there are uh, more singular fibers. But the important point that in co-dimension one is only E1 Kodaira fibers. And, and then you can uh, calculate the discriminant. It has some cusps and so on. So it's a complicated thing. But I will basically make a prediction for the chromofitten theory on this space, which uh, I think Martin also tried to solve it. It's not so easy. 
and then he resorted to the surfaces again. <laughs> and okay, anyway, so um, <coughs> so then, uh, but I, I want to, to give you this algebraic form. This is basically like a B model uh, expression to see how it connects to the local cases. Because if you take this P B zero, and you s uh, this depends on U and M, and you set it to zero, uh, well. Is actually like UV. This is actually the mirror curve. So it sort of has a. So this is the mirror curve, and it's a spectral curve of a matrix model, and it has many, many uh, nice properties. And uh, and you can also see how you achieve this. Um, you had, how do you achieve this? So basically, you say X E. This is the uh, class of the fiber. So you take it eight B to the A to the six. So the A is this. The B is this. And then you uh, <coughs> you send this. Uh, to zero, but you keep uh, somehow v fix, and then you get uh, uh, you get uh, this. Um, so I should say this uh, depends on b, and then it. Well, I mean this is this this m are mass parameters, but then it also depends on u, and the u are basically the same u, only you have an atal map between them. So basically, there's a u is u to the one six, so this is an atal map. Um, so that's the way you get um, you get this local geometries. But now <coughs> let me uh, change gears a little bit and say the same thing from the from the point of view of the A model. So for the A model, of course, I've given you the geometry. It's basically it's an elliptic vibration over B, and then you can use um, you can use uh, series <coughs> spectral, Larry's spectral, spectral sequence in order to get all the topology from the base if the fibers are not so singular. So, so the question was already asked. So today, uh, similar like in the talk of Martin, we take one se we have one section and only Cordyra I1 fibers uh, in Codim one, and uh, then everything is actually given by uh, this uh, spectral sequence. So, so now we use uh, Larray's spectral sequence to get uh, the top the topological data, the topology of M just from B. So that's a easy exercises, and it works uh, very nicely. So, um, so let me um, introduce some notations. So it doesn't pay to keep this formula, but so uh, <coughs> so basically now we introduce some classes. So we introduce the class of the fiber, which I call T, and I call this exponential thing Q. And then, um, <coughs> so this is uh, this is the. Uh, now we go to the homology. So what what do we have? So we have uh, we have a curve class. I call this curve class E for elliptic fiber. So this is the class of the fiber. And if you uh, uh, if you want to uh, calculate the scalar parameter, you just take what I said before. Uh, the b and the and the and the omega, the symplectic form, and integrated over this curve class. So this is this volume, and uh, then you have dual devices, and these dual devices, um, I also need name for them, and then you have the class beta. These are classes in the base. So these are these are in H two uh, B Z, and uh, then I have. Um, uh, uh, here I have, uh, well, the dual divisors go a little bit higher. So here the dual divisors, I should already have a DE. And I put a tilde here. Um, uh, so this is actually the class of uh, E, which is the class of the section. And then it's shifted by the canonical class of the basis. So this is just follows from the geometry of this. And here I have. Uh, classes which I call uh, DK. Um, so maybe I call this also K. So there might be K of them. And uh, that is um, just the. So here we have, of course, uh, we have, of course, uh, E uh, 
Uh, so we have a projection map from E to B, uh, where the fiber is here, and then this I call B, uh, P, and then uh, this one are, so to say, pull back from the base. So this is DK, and this, these are living on the base. So these are these classes, and, uh, <coughs> and now you can calculate all the intersection numbers just based on these classes and, uh, and, uh, and the uh, intersection numbers of the base. So that's an easy thing, but I need it for some later work. So let me just say that, um, okay, so you now calculate DE squared. So this was this class here. And this one just, just gives, um, this just gives uh, the integration of the uh, second churn class. So, so if I say C, uh, that uh, CK is always the churn class of the base. And if it's not the churn class of the base, I write the manifold. Okay, so this is the churn class of the base. And then we have, um, uh, then we have um, the, we have, let's say, D E times uh, D Case. So this is now intersected with this base classes once. And this is the C1 of the base times uh, D, uh, DK. So this DK is, is this guy. So this is a divisor on the base. And this number I will call uh, 12 a, uh, sorry, AK. So this is the definition of what AK is. And then you have... Um, intersection of DE, DJ, DK, and these ones are just given by intersection of the base. So this is uh, intersection of the base. So this is just uh, over the base, and you take the DJ, DI, and you integrate it over the base. <coughs> so this uh, gives all the intersection numbers, and the one which is uh, three times things of the base is, of course, zero, because it's a vibration. Okay, so then you can get more, so you can uh, basically get a C2 of M, so now this is in the total space, times DE, and you calculate it, and it's, uh, so this is uh, uh, like a hirzebruch riemann roch formula, and it's like this, and you can also calculate this one on these other types of devices, and it gives uh, 12 AK, this is what I introduced as AK, and then the Euler number is actually minus 60, times uh, C1 squared of the base. So for instance, in this case, this is this famous Euler number uh, 450. Minus 450 is the second example that Candelas ever looked at. This is this case. <coughs> okay, so then for a re I mean for uh, to see the, exhibit the, mod uh, the modularity, I have to make a little change in the, so this is the, this is the basis of the classes and the curves for the Mori cone. So this was the Mori cone. And uh, I make a little change from that uh, <coughs> and, uh, and uh, define DE. So this was also why they are tilted before. DE I shift again with this canonical pullback of the canonical class of the base. And then um, that will lead to, so, um, so if the QK were e to the 2 pi i TK, and this shifts these classes of the base by, uh, so they were before TK, and now they are get, get shifted like this, this tau. And, um, and then uh, why do I make this change of the base? I basically make this change of the base because I didn't like this coupling. So I like this coupling, I don't like this coupling sort of, which, uh, which, in, uh, which uh, mixes the fi fiber and the base in a way that I don't like. So basically now in this new base, so the, Key property, key property is that in the new base, so if I use these guys, then these guys are actually zero. And by the way, these DKs don't change, so they, they are just the same. <coughs> okay, so now I can start, uh, start um, stating the main uh, theorem, and then I try to prove the theorem. And, um, and this has very nice so to say, insight in the wave function transformation of the top, uh, compact topological string, and, and I also need this formula. So let me make the claim. So what is the claim? So now, uh, so we, 
of course, our goal is to expand the string partition function, and now I expand it in a particular way. So you have the uh, fiber class, you have these base classes that are defined, and you have the string coupling. And now you decide, so to say, to, um, to uh, expand it in terms of the base classes, as I said. So, and you, you uh, pull out beta equals zero, which is special. It's not Jacobi form, but the other will be Jacobi form. That's why you pull it out. And then you have, uh, the rest is a very systematic expansion. So it's a B in HMZ, and then it's a Z, B, tau, GS, and then it's QB. So, and basically the whole thing that I want to explain you today is why are these guys Jacobi forms? And how you can calculate them, and how you can eventually solve the problem. So that, that's the point. So this, these guys are, are the main characters in the rest of the talk. So what are the, what are the properties? So I give you a list of properties of this, of this uh, ZB uh, TGS. And uh, <coughs> so let's start with property one. So they have basically um, three properties, and I'm able to prove some of these properties. Um, <coughs> so let's start with property one. So, so what is this? So, um, so the set B tau GS are Jacobi forms. Uh, in fact, they are meromorphic Jacobi forms, not weak. So these guys have poles, which the poles come basically from here. So they are meromorphic Jacobi forms, and uh, <coughs> these meromorphic Jacobi forms, they have a weight, and they have an index, and the weight of this guy I call in general K, and it's zero, that's very good. And the index is actually, I call it M, and it depends on the base class, of course. And it's one half times, um, times the class B times B minus uh, the canonical class, so uh, one CB. And if you know a little bit of algebraic geometry, it's basically the genus of the curve in the base minus one. So that's the index. And, uh, and then this is not completely true. It's up to a, up to a multiplier system which is, however, very trivial. So the multiplier system comes because this quantity is not completely SL2Z invariant. So the multiplier system comes um, because um, if you make the S transformation on this Q beta, then you will find that this is actually uh, depends on the parity of this curve. So basically, it is a minus one to the C one times beta times Q beta. And if you make the T transformation on it, then it has a similar factor. So it's minus one C one B times Q beta. So, so this uh, this is a multiplier system, which uh, so so the so the set Bs have to spill out these factors to make this uh, expression invariant. Okay, so then. Um, the poles are, yeah, I will talk about the poles, but the poles are basically imposed from that. So they are, they are basically over Q, and that means they are the torsion point of the elliptic argument. So one of the most important things, of course, which physically is that you basically identify uh, Z with, uh, with Z, uh, G with Z, which is the elliptic argument of the weak Jacobi form. That's the most important point in, in this. So, so I, I don't know how much uh, I should say about Jacobi forms. So it's a pleasure to talk about them, but uh, many people know them, or many people don't uh, get too much out of it. But let me say one very trivial, very trivial thing. So, um, so Jacobi forms, so basically what is it? It's a map uh, from the upper half plane uh, times uh, C into C, and um, well, that's uh, here in the upper half plane lives what we call the elliptic argument, uh, sorry, the, the modular argument. So it's the modular argument, 
And here lives what we call the elliptic argument. And this is the one which is going to identify it with the string coupling. And uh, so they are, they can be holomorphic, meromorphic, whatever. And now um, <coughs> they have, of course, transformation properties. So uh, you say gamma is a matrix A, B, C, D in SL2Z. And then uh, <coughs> you can make the following, you have the following transformation properties. So basically, um, that's the defining transformation properties, modularity and modularity and, um, <coughs> and quasi-periodicity. And the modularity says, okay, the modularity says that if you uh, say this is this normal transformation, CT plus D, so it's the projective transformation, and it says that if you uh, now plug in here and you t uh, take the T of gamma, and then there's also a Z of gamma, which is just Z of C tau plus D, and you put here the Z of gamma, then this thing is basically invariant up to... Uh, a phase, and this phase is related to uh, the index of this guy. So that is the M. So it's related to the index, and then it is um, it is um, M, and then the C comes up. This is the C really from here, and then it's uh, C squared, and then it's over uh, C tau plus D. And, uh, and then, as I said, it's invariant uh, otherwise. So it's just the phase. And then the, <coughs> so this is the modularity. And the quasi-periodicity says if you, if you, it's, it's so to say a model, it, it gives a, a reason to call this the elliptic argument because elliptic curve, of course, you can shift by one and you can shift by tau and it should not be invariant, again, up to a phase. So that makes this an elliptic argument. So if you take C plus mu plus lambda tau, then again, it's basically the same up to a phase. Um, so it's e to the um, minus 2 pi m and then lambda tau plus uh, 2 lambda z. And by the way, here I forgot something important, which nobody seemed to have realized. So here is a factor of ct plus d to the K, and that gives the weight, and that is the other thing that, that comes in. Okay, so, they, so what I, hmm? the index comes in here. So the index is only coming as a phase. Okay, and then of course uh, I should say that you know Jacobi forms anyway, so many things are, the Weierstrass transform is a Jacobi form, the tether functions are Jacobi forms with vector value Jacobi forms, they are Jacobi forms. So there are lots of Jacobi forms that you know. <coughs> But the, Can you to of, uh, well, I mean, uh, the Jacobi forms have an expansion. If you expand them in Z, uh, then uh, you get uh, uh, then you get the quasi-modular forms. You get the Eisenstein series E2, E4, E6, and so on. So um, I guess that's all what I want to say about Jacobi forms. Um, but now. Well, at least at the general Jacobi form. So now, let me sort of uh, come to the property two. So the property two is the following. The property two is that the set B are not arbitrary Jacobi forms, but they are Jacobi forms of a very particular type. They have the dedicant Edda function raised to 12 times C1 times B. And then they have a numerator, phi B uh, tau of Z. And this one is a weak Jacobi form. So this is a very strong statement, as it turns out, Jacobi form. And this also is sort of in the title then, finally. And then the denominator is um, something which goes from L to 1 to uh, B2. So this is the uh, numbers of the classes in the base. And then it's an S from 1 to 
uh, BL. So BL is the else component of this vector B that gives the uh, class of the base. And then we have tau uh, S uh, Z. So I haven't told you what this guy is. But in order to tell you this, I have to go uh, say a little bit more uh, about the structural theorem of Jacobi forms. So there is a very important uh, theorem of Eichler and Sergei. So this uh, theorem says, basically, the weak Jacobi forms are finitely generated and freely, uh, freely um, <coughs> uh, from uh, by the Eisenstein series E4, the Eisensteins, and I call this actually Q, and then E6, uh, and then um, and then uh, two other arguments. So these this arguments have just made no index. And then there are, uh, uh, then there are things which have uh, uh, index, and that is uh, sometimes called gamma minus phi 1. So this is, uh, this is the notation. This is k, and this is m here. This is always like this, k and m. So this has uh, <coughs> k minus 1 and index m. <coughs> And um, and then it's the and I said you know Jacobi forms. You, of course, the Jacobi the, the tether functions they have a multiplier system, but there's one tether function which goes into itself, and that's tether one. And so this uh, this can be used to build a Jacobi form. And you have to square it, and then you take eta to the six, and you see this has so to say weight. Um, this has weight one. This has weight three. Then you have minus minus two. And then to the question that was already asked, you can sort of um, have two interesting expansions. So let me write this like this. Um, X1. So there is a product expansion, which is sort of nice um, and useful, actually. Um, so this, of course, just comes from the Jacobi triple product identity. And uh, is given like this. And now uh, to this other question. So you can write this in terms of um, uh, expansion in Z. And then this expansion coefficients will be actually um, uh, out of the ring of, um, of quasi-modular forms. So this is banned by E2, E4, and E6. So here is, a, is like this. And then it goes with order Z squared. Uh, sorry. This is order. This is, I'm 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 off in the order. So this is um, this is just set to the four, and so it's only it's only even. So for instance, if you want to do uh, open strings, of course you naively would say you have to do uh, odd Jacobi forms. They're even Jacobi forms. They're odd Jacobi forms. But you certainly get here only powers which are uh, even in Z, and that means uh, even in GL. Anyway, so this is the this is the story. And now you see why I picked this denominator, and that's why I left this formula. Basically, this denominator is precisely to reproduce these poles at the torsion point. Because you see, this square goes with G GS, with Z. So it has poles. And I uh, sort of uh, multiply here by S to get in this multi-covering that uh, generates these torsion points at the rational. I, I, put this, uh, I put here this power of this A. So it's basically to reproduce these uh, torsion points. And this is, uh, this, uh, I said this uh, is, is another generator. So there's another generator. So the other generator is uh, called B, by, and it has weight 0 and index 1. So B, people write like 0, 1. And this is, well, maybe I just be brief and don't, well, so it's one half of the elliptic genus of K3 that I suppose everybody knows. That is actually, so you take K1, uh, two, uh, two, three, four, and then you take a ratio of tether functions. So this is tether at the argument te uh, tau and Z equals zero. That's why you don't take the one. And then, um, so it's anyway has weight zero because you have this nice ratio and then the weight comes from this tether. So this is uh, K, T, uh, and then here is the full argument. 
and you square both of them, and that's that's the elliptic. Uh, so this is these are the other Jacobi Teda functions. So this is generated by these things, and um, <coughs> and this is already extremely powerful. The statement in the sense that so let's uh, go back to b is equal to p two. Well, now I tell you uh, for degree zero all fiber degrees. The only thing is that I have to fix a ring whose dimension you can easily uh, determine because I have told you the dimension of this z, uh, the, the index and the weight of that. Uh, Don Sagi has given you the index and the weight of this, and of course this is classic. And so then uh, I, I just can build an object which has the right index and the, right, and, and the weight, and it will be, let's say, z1. Well, let me just, so just z1 is as I said, uh, phi 1 over uh, eta to the 18, and then it will be just a, a tau z, and this is the only thing that I, I need to give you, and this, uh, this one is very primitive, so it's minus q over 48, and then 31 q cubed, and then 113 p. So this has, uh, has a weight uh, 12, 16, no index in this case because the formulas work out. And this gives already infinite number of predictions for a higher genus. And uh, so you can iterate this process. And then the, since the ring is not so small, at some point you would still run out of boundary conditions. But for instance, it's, it's easy to do it for b equals 6 in this case. That's okay. So you get a lot of, lot of predictions. And uh, I can sort of convert them in BPS invariants, give you integer numbers, and sort of this were the things that, um, that uh, well, you can also write it as Thomas and Thomas invariants and so on. So let me um, come to the property three. So the property three is also very nice. So the property three says that once the index is negative or uh, smaller than, actually smaller equal than zero, so there's a property three, property three, and uh, the claim is if mb is smaller equal zero, then, um, then um, <coughs> the phi, beta are completely fixed. fixed by the uh, vanishing, by the known vanishing uh, i g beta. So these are the BPS indices. And uh, basically, you know that, uh, that if g is greater, so this, this happens if g is basically too great, is too big. So this uh, happens if uh, there's a little bit of dependence on the on the base, but it basically goes uh, with the base degree. So if b is bigger than this number, then, uh, then this thing will be zero. And uh, you can show that if the index is negative, then this grows very sm uh, small, this room of uh, weak Jacobi forms. And then this, uh, this condition uh, solves it completely. So this particular solves the M string, the E string, the refined M string, the refined E string, things which have uh, singular fibers and so on. So this, this observation, because all these things, precisely the things that Soto and these people classified, they were uh, rigid in the base. So they, they, they rely on a negative self-intersection curve. Then uh, this is negative, the index, because of the formula I gave you. And then uh, you can solve it. So this solves a lot of theories. But uh, these are local theories. <laughs> so this is not, so it's the old thing. For some reason, the global theories are really, really much harder. But they are more trivial, uh, more non-trivial than the uh, usual local series that we look at for reasons that I now explain. So let me sort of, uh, in the last minutes, try to say you some interesting aspects of the proof of it. Yes? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So they, they are not doing this very good. But that's why we now work with them. <laughs> okay. Anyway. <coughs> so.
So, um, so let me let me say some interesting aspects of the proof. So, uh, I mean, the, I mean, property one is certainly the most important one. So let me try to uh, make you understand property one because it's very simple. So property one. So <coughs> you know that this. Um, I mean, first you have to uh, establish modularity. But I don't want to go into the details. Basically, there is a there is a formalism, which is uh, comes from the um, from the from the derived categories. So basically, in this case, there is a Fourier Mukai kernel. So in homological mirror symmetry, if you have a elliptic vibration, you have a uh, you have a certain property uh, of the Fourier Mukai kernel. So basically, what people always well, let me just uh, uh, sort of draw you one diagram so that you get that if you want to look it up, you can see it. So there's uh, two projections. You take m times m, and you take uh, two uh, projections to the base. And then <coughs> there is uh, this Fourier Mokai kernel. This is the only thing that you have to know. So this is, uh, is theta. So this is the discriminant. And then it's e times m um, minus m times e. And then. Um, and then you subtract only also C1 of the base. And uh, then when you have this object, then you can say that in the, so this is uh, basically homological mirror symmetry, and you have your, uh, you have the, <coughs> the A brains, but, uh, and then you know that the S transformation on F, and anything on F in the A brains can be uh, written out in terms of this Fourier Mokai kernel. So that's, uh, I mean, that's, uh, so you take some pullback of this, and then you take some left action on this map, and then you take F, and you take this uh, this Fourier Mokai kernel. So I guess I should write it like this, and then you uh, uh, you have P, and for uh, for some reason we also tensor it also, uh, always with. Um, so this has to do with my shift of basis. Um, well. Wow. So the upshot is when you have this formula and you know these classes, then you can write down an S transformation matrix entirely in terms of the uh, of the intersection uh, of the intersection of this thing. This works basically for fourfold, threefolds, uh, K three, whatever. So everything that has uh, mirror symmetry. So basically, then the S matrix. I just give you the S matrix. So the S matrix will be uh, something like one minus one. Uh, and then um, zero, 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 zero. So this is basically the S. This is the the block which is the S. And then the other thing, so to say, here is a block which have a K. And then there is a block which has uh, C K J. So basically, I, I write this like X naught, X K, uh, F naught. Um, sorry, uh, I introduce also a T, X T. And then I have F. Uh, not f t and f k. So this is basically is the the serious period. Then this is the one which uh, talks to the tau. This is the one which talks to the base classes, and these are the dual periods uh, in the same. And um, and it's a bit ugly. Uh, so x k. So this um, uh, yeah maybe you're writing a matrix. So then this one is AK, as I said, and then it has here 0, 0, and then it has this intersection matrix on the base, IK, and then it's minus 1 and 0, 0, 0, 0, and it has uh, AJ, and then it's um, A, that is A, no, 0, then it's C1 squared, and 0, 0, 0, and then minus AJ. And so there's all, all the section numbers. So the point is you can establish, and you can also do this by just looking at the analytic continuation of the periods. This is just a homological mirror symmetry argument. If you are powerful and want to analyze a system of, um, uh, let's say, where you have 10 moduli, two from the fiber, eight from the, uh, nine from the base, then you could also do this by analytic continuation. But, uh, but, the, but the mathematicians give you a very nice answer, and this answer is basically due to Bridgeland. He does this for K3s, and then other people like Yao and company have done it for higher dimensional cases. 
and uh, we can, I mean, they did it sort of wrong, so then we had to do it again. Uh, <coughs> but the, but it's anyway standard. And then there is the S transformation. The S transformation is even simpler. So the uh, so the T transformation. The T transformation you just tensor by, you just tensor F naught just by this line bundle. So then, uh, so T would be T of F naught. You just tensor this by a certain line bundle, and that's what we know as the T as the B field shift. So that's, uh, and again we t we do a little bit uh, shift by this class. So anyway, this matrix will be look similar all in the intersection numbers. The only thing that now you have uh, one, uh, one, uh, zero, one, and then other other classical intersection numbers. So why I'm saying this? So I'm saying this because to show you that if you have a, a partition function and you have the symmetry, then you would expect it to be modular because after all, uh, this uh, this uh, these are the um, these are the space time. Uh, generators of the space-time duality, and if you have an uh, object on the Calabiao, it should better be modular. I mean, this is what string theory tells you. And, and now I want to make the one important point before I finish. So the one important point is, so if you look at Witten's um, wave function transformation property, I already alluded to this a little bit. Uh, then, <coughs> so you have, so Witten says, okay, we have this um, e to the uh, g equals zero to infinity, and then we have this, what I wrote already before. The only uh, difference is he now uh, calls this the wave function. And then he goes into geometric quantization of H2R. So then you do geometric quantization. H3MR, and you want that this, so to say, doesn't uh, depend on the polarization. And uh, since the polarization is given by the uh, change of the complex structure, you get a differential equation uh, in this complex structure. And this is, looks like a heat equation, and it looks like this. There's a, so it's because, uh, <coughs> so um, uh, let me say a couple of things. So basically, he, sa he sets this like this, h bar, and then he has an h bar squared, and then he has an alpha, beta, gamma. So this is originally how, it, how he writes it, uh, beta. So this is a bar index, and this is a gamma, and then this guy annihilates this wave function. So this is the is the infinitesimal statement for the fact that this wave function should not depend on the polarization. And since the polarization is induced on which complex structure you use, there is a, uh, is a, dif is a differential with respect to this complex structure. This is a complex structure. Okay, and then you see, and many people have looked at this, including BCOV, and you say this, this cannot be right. Well, it cannot be right for two reasons, and let me sort of give you the trivial reason. So first of all, well, so, well, it is right, but people thought it was not right, and I should uh, tell you why it is right after all. So basically, um, let me give you first uh, one, make a, make a small remark. So I said already that this is bizarre, because uh, here you have no uh, invariance, right? You shouldn't take this. Rather, you should take x naught. Some period, you can take any period, but this period should be so that it cancels the Kähler transformation. Otherwise, this object makes no sense in the beginning. I mean, because it's not invariant on the Kähler transformation. So, and if you do that, and you look at this transformation, you will see that x naught actually goes under st transformation, because this is x naught, it goes to x naught, uh, C tau plus D. So if this goes, transforms like this, then these guys have to compensate that. And if they compensate that, then um, these guys mu must be modular forms of a certain weight. So it follows, it follows that um, the FG are as a function of tau, so this holds all in the limit of the base uh, expansion, are 
uh, are forms, modular forms of a certain weight. Of a weight. And uh, the weight you can, it's just, uh, the weight is just given by this index 2g minus 2. And now comes the second thing that is very important. But now this guy is almost quasi-periodic uh, because of the Gopakumavafa formula. So you know already that z goes to z plus 1 is actually an okay transformation. Of, uh, this is because of the uh, BPS formula. So if this is a correct transformation and you have this property, you can see easily that you also, ha also have to have to shift by tau. That's trivial. You just write it down, this expansion, you shift this by, by this amount, and then you use that as invariant, and you have to see that this is actually not just a shift, but it has to also be shifted by tau, must be also possible. So this implies, this implies uh, quasi-periodicity. So, so this is very trivial in some sense. So, but you have to see the following. I mean, you don't really change the polarization because you, 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 you just rotate the A matrices. Changing the polarization means changing the B periods and the A periods. You don't do this. So if you would change the B periods, then you would actually change the polarization and the whole thing becomes very intriguing. So then it's not so easy to say what is the invariant of it. But here we got lucky because, um, because we have these uh, monodromies which just change, uh, so to say, the A, A, peri A periods, not the B periods. So the full power of this whole thing that I may be saying would be for the quintic when you have this uh, transformation, but you also change the polarization. Then it will be very, very powerful, uh, even for this case, I believe. And then uh, there was a second point that um, I should really finish quickly. As I said, I mean, this, this quantity, look at this at g equals zero. So, in, uh, so at, the, at the lowest order in h. So in lowest order of h bar, this thing is simply wrong. Because if you pull this down, then you get something. So now uh, I, I, um, I sort of absorb this. I mean, I sort of introduce a new parameter like this. Uh, well, this was, is the h. So it's just a power counting parameter. So now I uh, d take the derivative of respect v with h and look in the lowest order in h bar. Then, of course, uh, this gives an anti-holomorphic derivative of, uh, of f naught which is the prepotential, and it gives something here from, uh, which is not vanishing, because this one uh, is uh, a holomorphic derivatives. So then everybody says, I mean, like, um, like Bershatsky and Digraf and people who talked about the OSV conjecture, they all say, forget about the genus zero part. This thing has to be modified. Uh, and uh, and uh, they modify it simply by, say, by, uh, by excluding all the uh, consequences of it at genus 0. And genus 1, actually. Genus 1 is also a problem. So precisely the cases where you have this killing field on the world sheet are a problem. So I'm saying this is not what you should do. So what you actually should do, there is a, even in the old literature on special geometry by Strominger, there is an unholomorphic prefotential. And this has very much to do also with the talk of of Bel uh, <coughs> Bel I mean, so, both. so there is an unholomorphic prepotential. And this unholomorphic prepotential has the property that the triple couplings are not given by this, but they are given by the covariant derivative of that. Um, so it's the covariant derivative, let's call this unholomorphic prepotential S. And you see, since this contained, uh, our, uh, I mean, this one is, is, is more trivial, but they, they start containing the Christopher symbols of the connection, so they are not holomorphic. So if this is going to be holomorphic, which of course is true in conformal field theory, because you fix three points on the sphere, there's no de degeneration. That is holomorphic. But this one will be not holomorphic. I mean, this would not work if this is holomorphic. So take it as non-holomorphic. So, so the point that I'm making is, <laughs> This thing works if you take this old definition of Strominger for the non-holomorphic p potential. But then you can ask, do you know that object? And it turns out you know it. It is precisely the propagator of BCOV. So, um, 
well, they are in BCOV series are propagators. And uh, what, I'm, what I call S is actually S, so that's why I call it propagator. So I, I, I take the bar of the, of the propagator of BCOV, and then I uh, take a factor of the Kähler factor to, make it, to give it the right Kähler weight. So this is the Kähler factor, so that this has, well, this had, for instance, uh, uh, minus 2, and then uh, I wanted to have, I know it has 2, so I wanted to have it minus 2, 1, and this has clearly 2, 2, this factor. So there I make it the right weight, and this thing is actually fulfills it. And now you can think, what is then this equation? Is it really fulfilled or not, if you take the, a different uh, uh, definition? And it turns out it's fulfilled, and it's very beautiful. It's basically fulfilled by this Ramanujan identity for modular form. So you take, well, I mean, it's so to say convenient to write this as a matrix of propagators, which is, um, well, you change the coordinate, but it's basically 2s, si, si, so there are three types of propagators in BCOV, and so there's, uh, this is a change of matrix, and then you have immediately a property of this uh, big propagators, which actually we have found in the paper with Marcos and Grimm and some people uh, in Malin, uh, Weiss, I guess. And this is like C, K, M, N, and then it's the propagator again, M, I, uh, propagator N, J. And you see, this is precisely, when you, when you uh, complex conjugate, this is precisely what you need. It's precisely, if you take this S as the propagator, you precisely fulfill this equation. And, uh, and why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because from this equation, if it's correct, then you, can, uh, then you can get also the index. So you just calculate it and use the properties of this in terms of the topological numbers, and then you get the index. So the other properties, I mean, the property three is easy to establish. The property two is not so easy to establish, also part of the, the thing that the paper is not out. And, um, but um, yeah, maybe I should uh, finish. <laughs>